Welcome to another episode of the Spiritual Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Mary Beth, founder of Day One Life Coaching. And this podcast is an extension of my practice. I'm a spiritual and transformational life coach, and I have a, an amazing and incredible guest today. His name is Michael Hinkson. I'm going to read a little bit about him and so you can understand why I wanted him to be on this podcast. He's so inspirational. Um, on September 11th, 2001, a blind man escaped the World Trade Center by walking down 78 flights of stairs with his guide dog, Roselle. Days later, America fell in love with Mike and Roselle and the special bond that helped them both survive one of the country's darkest days. Immediately after the 9-11 tragedy, Michael was featured on the Larry King Live Show five times. To quote Larry King, Michael Hingson is an international hero honored and awarded by top organizations worldwide. This media exposure changed the course of Michael's life and launched him into a speaking career that has spanned over 19 years. He now travels the world as a keynote and inspirational speaker that can motivate audiences to action. Welcome to the show, Michael. I got that right from your website. It was just so beautiful. And I, I just love what you're doing here. How are you doing today? Doing well. Thank you for having me on the uh, the podcast. I'd say thank you for having Alamo, my current guide dog, but he's sleeping, so he won't. Is notice. he sleeping? <laughs> yeah, he is. I think he is anyway. His head's down. I think I got to meet him last time when we we talked on our pre podcast. I got yeah. to meet Alamo. So, um, so let's let's talk about this. Let's let's first go back a little bit. I know you have so many motivational stories and life lessons, and um just that I would love to discuss in addition to the 9-11 story. But I know a lot of people are going to want to hear that because it's huge. <laughs> and not many, you know, not many people have been through anything quite that scary and dark. Um, so let's let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, let's go back to 9-11 and tell me a little bit about that day um, working in the towers. You know, it was a great place to work. We were on what was called a, a sky lobby floor. That is, elevators went straight from the first floor up to 78 without stopping. Um, wow. There were two floors where that happened. One set of elevators went to floor 44, and the other set went to 78 from the first floor. And then there were elevators to get to floors in between, and there are elevators then also to get to floors between from the first floor to the 44th. But for me, it was really great because we had an elevator that we get in and, and just a few seconds later, there we are. It was um, really a lot of fun. And when we had people come, I was the Mid-Atlantic Region Sales Manager for Quantum Corporation, a computer hardware manufacturer. And I love to tell people who seem not to be familiar with the World Trade Center that we'll reserve a special elevator for you so you'll come straight to our floor. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun. Of course, a lot of people bought it. And um, so it was it was really a lot of fun to, to have people there. And we had a great view of the south end of Manhattan. And so um, on that day, we were going to be holding some sales seminars. Now, I should go back and explain a little bit that I spent time when I first started working in the World Trade Center learning about the complex. So all of you cited or what I tend to refer to as light-dependent people don't <laughs> spend a lot of time working on knowing the building. You expect to be able to read signs. The problem with that is if you ever find yourself in an area that is smoke filled or the power goes out, you're stuck. Mm -hmm. Hence light dependency, which is as much a disability as I have, except that since Thomas Edison invented the electric light bulb, we have also spent basically a hundred and, um, you know, 40 years, 46, 47 years, 46 years, um, creating better means of having light on demand so that you can see almost any time of the day or night. It doesn't change the fact that you are still light dependent. I was in a hotel last year where the power went out at three in the afternoon. You just can't imagine. Well, maybe you can. The <laughs> screams I heard from everybody who was suddenly panicky because they couldn't see. Well, didn't bother me a bit. And, <laughs> and, and so 
I think that when we talk about disability, I view it differently. I consider disability to be a characteristic that everyone has that just manifests itself differently for different people. And the problem is we've got to get away from thinking that disability means a lack of ability. People say to me all the time, but disability starts with dis. And I say, yeah, so does disciple and so does discreet. And the Mm -hmm. last time I checked, those aren't negative things. So you need to change your dialogue and you need to change your perceptions. And some people take that to heart. Many people still don't. But anyway, I spent a lot of time when I first started working in the World Trade Center, learning about the complex and literally getting to know everything I could about what to do in an emergency. What I didn't realize until much later was that was also creating a mindset in me such that if there was an emergency, I'd know what to do. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I did prepare not only for my own benefit, because I knew that there would be times I might be in the building and would be in the office alone. But I also knew that as the leader of the office and having other people who work for me and so on, I was responsible for them. And I wanted to make sure that I would be prepared. So when the things that happened on September 11th occurred, the reality is the mindset kicked in. So what happened on September 11th at about 8.45, we heard kind of a muffled explosion. The building sort of shuttered. And then I'm now tip, I'm holding up my hand and tipping it toward the screen. That's what the building did. We literally tipped maybe about 20 feet. And then the building came back because tall buildings like that, as I had learned, are really big springs. They have expansion joints. They're made to be buffeted in the wind. An airplane hit the Empire State Building in the 1940s. It was a military aircraft that got lost in a fog bank. And the Empire State Building survived because buildings like that are flexible. Hmm. Anyway, the building came back and immediately what occurred was that I called my guide dog, Roselle, who was asleep under my desk. And uh, I took her leash and told her to heal, which meant to come around on my left side and sit, which she did. Then about that time, the building dropped straight down about six feet because the expansion joints went back to their normal configuration. Hmm. So then, um, we, we worked to get out. Um, I had a colleague from our corporate office who was in for the day because we were doing some sales seminars, teaching our partners how to sell our products. So David Frank, my colleague, um, took our guests to the stairs. I told him, don't let them take the elevators because I knew David actually saw fire outside um, and above us, uh, which of course was because the airplane blew a hole through the whole building from the north side to the south side where we were 18 floors above us. And I told David, don't let our guests take the elevators because I knew the fire could get into the elevator shafts, which it did. I said, get them to the stairs and start them down. And he did and then came back and then we went to the stairs and started down. And by that time, I had also called my wife and told her that something happened and we needed to exit the building. Well, suffice it to say, we went down. We had no idea what happened. We figured out an airplane hit the building because soon after entering the stairwell, I began smelling an odor and I realized that what I was smelling were the fumes from burning jet fuel. I knew that odor because I was at a lot of airports and traveled a lot for my company where I flew. So anyway, um, we figured an airplane hit the building and I observed it to other people and they said, yeah, you're right. We must have been hit by an airplane, but we didn't know any more than that and didn't actually no more until both buildings had collapsed. So anyway, we got downstairs, went outside, and then it, it happened that the way we, we walked, we were told to leave the area. And by the way, David, when we got outside, saw fire in Tower 2. And of course, we had no idea where that came from. So we walked north on Broadway on the west side of the street. And we got up to Vesey Street, which put us fairly close to Tower 2. And David said, you know, I can see the fire really clearly. I want to stop and take some pictures. He took out a camera. I got out my cell phone. I tried to call my wife, Karen. I couldn't get through. I put my phone away, and David was putting his camera away when a police officer yelled, get out of here. It's coming down now. Actually, he used a little bit more colorful language than that. But but anyway, um, suddenly we heard this kind of rumbling sound. I describe it as kind of a combination of a freight train and a waterfall. You could hear metal clattering and glass breaking. And then the building just dropping straight down, the white noise waterfall sound, which was the building pancaking straight down. Mm. 
And um, everyone turned and ran. David ran. He was gone. And uh, Roselle and I turned 180 degrees, and we started running back the way we came. And I remember the first thing that I thought when we turned around was, God, I said to myself, I can't believe that you got us out of a building just to have it fall on us. And then I heard a voice in my head as clearly as you're hearing me today. And by the way, we wrote about this in my book, Thunderdog, and we'll get to that. Yeah. But um, I heard a voice that said, don't worry about what you can't control. Focus on running with Roselle and the rest will take care of itself. And I had this complete sense of peace that if we worked together, we'd be fine. Well, we ran to the next street after Vessi, now going south. That was Fulton Street, turned right, ran about 25 yards, caught up to David, who had ran the same way, realized that he had just run off without me and was going to try to come back and find me. But I found him first, so we kept running. Then we got caught in all the dust cloud, the dirt and debris from Tower 2's collapse. And we knew we had to get out of that. David said he couldn't see his hand six inches in front of his nose. And um, I didn't know whether Roselle could see my hand signals that I was giving her oh, yeah. or hear me even over the sound. But I kept saying, Roselle, right, right, because we had to get out of the dust cloud. So I wanted to get into a building that was next to us. Well, suddenly I heard an opening on my right. And Roselle obviously knew what I wanted. She turned right. She took one step and stopped and wouldn't move. Come on, Roselle, keep going. She wouldn't move. Roselle, keep going. She wouldn't move. And then I realized, focus on running with Roselle and the rest will take care of itself. She must have stopped for a reason. So I investigated with sticking out a foot and reaching along the wall and discovered we were at the top of a flight of stairs. Oh, my Roselle, goodness. <laughs> Roselle had stopped and wasn't going to move until she got the right command, which was forward. Mm. Which is the guy, which is the command to give a dog to go down the stairs or go forward. Well, she got a hug before we did anything else. <laughs> and then I told her to go forward and we walked down the stairs, met some other people who were at the bottom of the stairs. It was a small arcade area. We were there for a couple of minutes and then um, a gentleman came up from further down in the stairs. It was the Fulton Street subway station and we were in the small arcade entrance at the top. <clears throat> this guy came up, he introduced himself as Lou, an employee of the subway system. He said, come on with me, I'll take you down to an employee locker room. There were about nine of us. We went down there and went to the locker room. There were a few other people there. There were fans and a water fountain and so on. And we just sat on benches in shock. You know, who knew? Yeah. Who, who had an idea of what was going on? We were there about 15 minutes. And then a police officer came and said, you need to leave now. The air is better up above Without waiting for discussion, he turned and left. We all followed him up the stairs through that arcade entrance, then up the last two small flights of stairs, and we're outside. David looked around. The air was a little better, but there was a lot of dust and debris in the air. But David looked around and he said, oh, my God, Mike, there's no Tower 2 anymore. And I said, what do you see? He said, all I see are finger, or excuse me, pillars of smoke hundreds of feet tall. And we stood there a moment, and then we just continued west on Fulton Street, walked for a while. And we were in this little plaza area when we heard the freight train waterfall sound again. We knew it had to be our tower collapsing. Um, we found a small retaining wall and ducked down behind it, and wind passed over us, and there was noise and all sorts of things. And then when it all died down, we stood up. And David said, oh, my God, Mike, there's no World Trade Center anymore. And I said, what do you see? And he said, all I see are fingers of fire and flame, hundreds of feet tall and pillars of smoke. It's gone. And the World Trade Center was gone. So, um, you know, at that point, um, what, what could we do um, other than just stand there in amazement um, I tried to call my wife, Karen, again, and this time I got through to her. And she's the first one who told us that two aircraft had been crashed into the towers, one to the Pentagon, and a fourth was still missing over Pennsylvania, which is, of course, Flight 93 that crashed in Shanksville. Mm. And she, she's the one who told us about the hijacking. So now it's about 1031 or 1032, an hour and 45 minutes from the time that the planes hit. And this is the first time we really knew what happened. So later in the day, we, we uh, got up to, well, 
um, the university section of New York and then later learned that the buses and trains were sort of running again and I wanted to get back to my home in New Jersey. And David wanted to get to where he was staying. He, His sister lived on the Upper East Side. So we went and we actually got a bus that got me to the train station, Penn Station, excuse me, Penn Station. And then David walked the rest of the way up to his sister's house. And I got a train to Newark and then another train to Westfield, New Jersey. I called my wife along the way and kept her apprised. <clears throat> and at seven o'clock, we pulled in and I heard our van come to the um, to the curb. By the way, I should explain, Karen used a wheelchair her whole life. So we had a wheelchair accessible van, fairly distinctive sound. <laughs> and a friend, a friend had driven Karen over to the train station. Tom had come down to be with us, um, not knowing whether I was at home or in the World Trade Center or whatever until he got there. And then Karen told him. And Tom was a friend that Karen had known in high school in California, but he was now living in New Jersey. Anyway, he drove her to the train station. They picked me up. We went home. And then I took Roselle's harness off, figuring I'd take her outside because it's the first time in 12 hours that she had had a chance to go to the bathroom and she would have none of it. She shot off as soon as I disconnected her leash. She grabbed her favorite tug bone and started playing tug of war with my retired guide dog, Linny. It was over for her. There was nothing that wow. directly attacked her or affected her. And so it was over. It was done. Didn't bother her a bit. One Isn't of the lessons amazing? and one of the, well, it's, it's something that we don't learn very well. And, and I consulted with the guide dog veterinarian and other people later at Guide Dogs for the Blind. And they asked, well, was she attacked or did anything hit her directly? And I said, no. And they said, well, there's your answer. Dogs don't do what if, which is something that we should think about a lot. Um, and so it was over. There was no fear in her and she did fine. So that's really the story of what happened that day. And of course, later, then eventually we did write a book about it called Thunderdog, the story of a blind man, his guide dog and the triumph of trust, which is still available. It was published in 2011 with a number one New York Times bestseller. Larry King wrote the foreword to it. Nice. And it was, um, it was, it was an honor to be able to write it. I, um, <clears throat> I was called in 2010 by a woman who was writing a book herself about dogs and it was called dog tales. And she wanted to put Roselle's story in. And after I told her my story, she said, you should write your own book and I'd like to help. And Susie Flory did, and we collaborated and we wrote it together. And um, then it was published um, in 2011. Her agent, Chip McGregor was our agent and got us a contract with Thomas Nelson Publishing, which was the largest Christian publisher at that time. Now it's part of HarperCollins. And um, and it's out there. So I hope people will go buy Thunderdog. Yeah. And then now you have Live Like a Guide Dog. That's your most recent book, correct? That that is that will be that is is published in August. Okay. And <clears throat> I'm in Tyndale Publishing House is publishing it. And um, yes, it's Live Like a Guide Dog, True Stories from a Blind Man and His Dogs About Being Brave, Overcoming Adversity, and Walking in Faith. Mm. And the idea is that when the pandemic hit, <clears throat> I should explain that after September 11th, people started asking me to come and speak to tell my story and to talk about lessons we should learn from things like September 11th. <clears throat> and I had been on Larry King Live and a lot of other media got my story. So we got pretty visible. So people started calling and asking if I would speak. And I made the decision that rather than selling computer hardware, selling life and philosophy was a whole lot more fun and personally rewarding than selling <laughs> hardware. So I've been a public speaker ever since. But with the pandemic, a lot of that stopped. <clears throat> so I started learning about podcasting and eventually was able to um, to join a company that asked me to do a podcast for them. So I joined a company called Accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I, capital B-E. And Accessibe is a company that makes products to help make the internet uh, more inclusive and accessible by making websites more accessible, something that everyone should do anyway. But what happened was that um, I learned about podcasting and then talking with the CEO and he learned that I was thinking about trying to do a podcast. He said, we'd love you to do a podcast for us. And I said, what? He said, oh, you decide. We just want a podcast that will show that accessibility is part of the world. So 
We did that. We started Unstoppable Mindset, where inclusion, diversity, and the unexpected meet. And mostly it's unexpected, not inclusion or diversity. The unexpected is anything that's not inclusion or diversity related, which is most things. Yeah, true. (laughs) So we started that. But along the way, I also learned um, and thought about this whole idea of, well, you worked in the World Trade Center. You weren't afraid. You weren't afraid because, as I realized, I had developed a mindset of knowledge and certainty of what to do. Mm -hmm. And I said, I've talked about that a lot, but I've never taught people how to learn to control fear. So we wrote Live Like a Guide Dog as a book that will help people learn how they can control fear. And it isn't to say, don't be afraid. It is to say, don't let fear blind you or paralyze you or overwhelm you. And you can learn techniques that will teach you how to do that. And I based the book on lessons that I learned from working with eight guide dogs and then working also with my wife's service dog, Fantasia. <clears throat> and so the, the issue is that there's a lot we can learn from our dogs if we really work with them and learn and develop teaming and trusting relationships with them. One of the lessons as I mentioned earlier, is they don't do what if. And the problem is we do what if about everything in the world. And so we develop a lot of phobias and fears. And as Mark Twain and others have pointed out, the problem with most of our fears is they never happen. (laughs) So we can learn how to do that. We There are things and techniques that we can learn. So the book is really all about teaching people to learn that they can control fear and use being afraid as a powerful tool to help focus and keep us alert. I love that. And I love that you're saying, you're not saying ignore fear or pretend like it doesn't happen. You're saying like, it's more like fear management is what it is absolutely about fear management and use it in the right way. The problem is we generally don't teach ourselves or our children or each other about controlling fear, but we can, and, and we can learn that we can use that fear, as I said, a very powerful motivator and tool to help us in anything that we do. Now, there are things that we can't control. I have never been able to be convinced that we could have predicted the World Trade Center events happening. And so I say to people, we had no control over the World Trade Center terrorist attacks happening, but each of us has control over how we deal with them and how we move forward. And the problem is I've seen so many people go down some pretty dark roads. I met one gentleman who joined the New York Police Department. He had been a firefighter, but he decided he's going to join the police department because he wants to kill those terrorists. Mm-hmm. You know, what good is that going to do? And, exactly. you know, I've, I've had other people who I've talked with who've had similar sorts of things. And rather than recognizing <clears throat> that what we need to do is to work on developing our own mindset to be stronger. We go down all sorts of other other pathways. We've got politicians today who who do nothing but foment fear, and they want us to be afraid of one thing or another. Um, And the other part about it is that they want us to trust them, and all too many of us do, without ever really analyzing what they do or what they say. And the reality is that we should be open to trust, but we need to learn to trust, not just because somebody says, trust me. And we should look at what people do and analyze it ourselves individually and make decisions based on that. Because if we just go off and say, well, I trust this guy or I trust that woman or whatever, maybe that's a good thing and maybe not. But the bottom line is, How do you really know? It's like, I trust I'm always going to be able to see signs to get out of a building if there's an emergency. Yeah, right. (laughs) So the the bottom line is that we really need to learn for ourselves. And anyone who says, but I don't have the time for that is being silly. Um, Mm -hmm. Of course we do. One of the things that I tell people all the time nowadays is at night before you go to bed, maybe also in the morning when you first wake up, Think about, well, let's take the night before. Think about everything that happened the day um, that you're falling asleep. Now it's at night. 
Think about what happened that day. What was good? What wasn't good? What went well? What didn't go well? Even the things that went well, could I have done something better? What didn't go well? Never call it a failure. It's not a failure. It is, it didn't go well. You don't fail. You learn from it. You have the opportunity, hopefully, to move forward and learn from what happened that day, but it's not a failure. And you've got to get over thinking such negative thoughts. I used to say I'm my own worst critic, and now I don't. I say I'm my own best teacher because I'm not going to look at things from a negative standpoint. Yes, every mistake that... You know, I'm, I'm not saying mistake free at all. I've made tons of mistakes. That's why I'm a life coach. <laughs> you know, like I see my mistakes as, you know, opportunities for growth. And that is a huge mindset shift. And yet you're, you're the perfect example of um, victim versus victor m- mentality. We can be the victors of our life or we can think there's that popular saying that everybody's saying right now is it's that shift from, you know, instead of life is happening to me, life is happening for me. And the words you had me thinking of when you were talking about the trust thing is is discernment. Discernment is a is you know wisdom, and I don't think it's something that we're born with. <laughs> we're definitely that comes through life experience, and um, just getting to that point where we don't just trust something because somebody's telling us to trust them. We develop that, and I think a lot of our development of that is through our intuition too, and just being in wisdom of of just being through experience and really trusting what I believe is intuition is our connection with God. Well, two things. So first of all, you said you've made lots of mistakes, right? Growth opportunities. When did you you make a mistake? (laughs) Not, Not what was the mistake, but my point is until you made it and you realized that it was a mistake, was it a mistake? Did you intentionally make the I mistake? I think it's only like if you continue to do it. So like bad, okay, okay, bad but, decisions. But, but the, point the, is, the point is you do something and <clears throat> then you realize, oh, I made a mistake. Now you're right. The next part of that is, do you learn from it? Which is why I really love to talk about self-analysis and people thinking about themselves at night and thinking about what they did and use that time to analyze what what we're calling a mistake and say to yourself, how do I move forward from that? What do I learn? So I won't do that again. And that's of course the whole point. And I've had any number of people tell me, I don't have time to do that. Balderdash. Of course you do. (laughs) Your brain's working all the time. You have time. So that's one thing. Here's the other. Do you ever play trivial pursuit? Um, I have in the past. Yes. So you're playing the game and somebody asks you a question and you immediately instantly think of an answer. How often do you, before you give that answer, think, oh, maybe that isn't really right. And you think, and you give another answer, which turns out to be the wrong answer because what you originally thought was the right answer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All too often. And that's the intuition part of it. Yes. Our, our minds know a lot and are ready to communicate. And doing um, analysis of ourselves and thinking about what happens and, and really just slowing down our minds is all part of the training of learning to listen to our heart and our mind um, and to God as, as we go forward. And we can do that, but we need to take the initiative to make that happen. That's a choice. Either we can develop that mind muscle and, um, and let it help improve us, or we just continue to make the same mistakes again because we don't let history and what happens with us and to us be a teacher. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. Yes, we have to do this. And you can't afford not to. Like if somebody says they don't have the time, like you can't afford not to take that time. But people do all the time, which is unfortunate. I know. I know they do. (laughs) I used to be that person, you know, and now I know that like these days you're doing a lot of, um, I was looking at your website and looking at all of the things that you're doing with, of course, your radio appearances and your um, speaking engagements and stuff. Um, A lot of things that you're helping motivate people with is, I'm just gonna list the ones that you had on your website, trust and teamwork, the human animal bond, inclusion versus diversity, strategies for the future and adapting in challenging times, all really important topics. 
And another one that we put up there last year, and I need to get it up on the website, it's a speech called What Would You Do When, which talks all about emergency preparedness. Okay, yes. Yeah, it's a lot of us, we just want to ignore that stuff and pretend like nothing's ever going to happen. We're the same way with death. You know, we don't want to talk about the inevitable sometimes. Like, you know, there, there's, um, there's, it's no one's getting out of that. <laughs> well, let's talk about trust. Let's, let's talk about trust and okay. getting back to live like a guide dog. Okay. I really do believe dogs love unconditionally. I, I see no reason why that isn't true unless a dog is so abused by people that it, it develops a, a different mindset, if you will. But what dogs are not is they do not unconditionally trust from the outset. But the difference between dogs and people, so they'll love people, but they won't necessarily trust. But they're open to trust, which is something that we're unfortunately all too often learning not to do, which goes back to what we were talking about with politicians and so on. <laughs> you know, oh, trust me, don't trust that guy. He's a real jerk. He's a crook. He's whatever. And it's, it's the same thing. And the problem is people buy into that rather than really looking beneath the surface themselves. And when, um, so people, and then they're burned, if you will, and then they become less trustful and they become less open to trust. You work at a company and um, you, you decide you're going to trust a colleague who betrays your trust. What do you do? You close up. And um, what you don't do is take the time to go, what were the signs that I should have learned or saw <clears throat> that maybe I shouldn't have been quite as trusting to this person? Or what are the signs I'm seeing from this other person that says you really can trust them and that they want to trust you. And that's the issue. Trust is a two-way street and dogs instinctively know that if, if uh, they're open to trust and you earn their trust, uh, then they also get to earn your trust. And having worked with eight guide dogs now for almost 60 years, not all at the same time, they haven't lasted 60 <laughs> years, <clears throat> but, but, it's working with a guide dog is, is developing a team. It's as close knit of a team as you will find anywhere. The dog and I have to learn to trust each other. We each have a job to do. So for example, I'm walking down the, the sidewalk with a guide dog. We come to a curb, the dog stops, which is what the dog's supposed to do. I listen to hear the traffic. And when the traffic is moving the way I want to move, I tell the dog forward. The dog's job is to make sure that we walk safely. The dog doesn't know where I want to go and how to get there. That's not what a dog's, a guide dog's job is. But the dog is the animal that, that keeps us safe when we're walking. So anyway, we get to the curb, we stop. Then I say forward and we step out into the street. Suddenly the dog jerks backward. I am going to always pay attention to what that dog does. I'm not going to go, what are you doing? Getting distracted because probably what I didn't hear was the hybrid car that's coming at us down the street. Right. right. And the reality is that um, the dog sensed and did the right thing. And my job is to follow the dog. And we work together enough that we truly learn how to trust each other and deal with all the different things that come along. And I mentioned before about Roselle at the top of the stairs going into the Fulton Street subway station. I could have just kept going, come on, Roselle, and jerked her, and then we kind of fall down the stairs, right? right? But I realized, no, she stopped for a reason. And if the dog jerks back, she did it for a reason. Or now it's Alamo, he did it for a reason. But it's a trust. And the dog knows that I respect what they do. And I know that, that they respect my part in the team building relationship and in the teaming relationship. And make no mistake, that is an absolute certainty that each of us knows. It, it's a relationship that builds over time and gets stronger and stronger. And the last thing, and I think about it constantly, the last thing I ever want to do is to do anything that would betray that trust. That's how seriously the teaming relationship is, just like it should be for any team. Right. So if everybody lived like, like guide dogs lived, we would have a really happy, happy world. We would certainly have a much better world, yeah. <clears throat> 
And and um, if if they all did, we'd have a very trusting world, and it would be a much more productive world than we have now. So yeah, you um, discuss being afraid can be a positive thing. Talk about that a little bit. Well, the the issue of of fear. All right. So so first of all, there is a physiological reaction that takes place, and you can get very nervous and perspire and things like that. But mentally speaking. Um, you become concerned. Something's going on. Okay, I understand that. But the issue is, do you just start imagining all sorts of horrible things and letting the fear overwhelm you, or as I put it, blind you? (laughs) Um, And so you can't make a decision, or do you go, okay, what's going on? So let me give you an example. On September 11th, the building was hit, and when the building straightened out, and then it dropped. <clears throat> David, my colleague, turned and looked out the window and started shouting, oh, my God, Mike, there's fire and smoke above us. There are millions of pieces of burning paper falling outside the window. And I had heard things brushing by our window. And I was wondering, what is that? Because it's, it's the usual sound that we would hear when the window washers are on their tracks and they're washing the windows. But, it, it you know, it certainly wasn't. But David kept saying, there's fire and smoke. We got to get out of here right now. And I said, slow down, David. No, we got to get out of here right now. We can't stay here. And I said, slow down. And finally, he used what I love to call the big line. You don't understand. You can't see it. Of course, we always get back to that, right? Mm -hmm. The problem was not what I wasn't seeing, but what David wasn't seeing. I had sitting next to me a dog who wasn't exhibiting fear. And I knew what Roselle was like when she was afraid because she was afraid of thunderstorms. She would shake and she would shiver and she would pant and so on. She wasn't doing any of that. She was yawning and wagging her tail and going, who the heck woke me up? I was sleeping good. (laughs) And that told me that whatever was going on, and I believed everything that David saw, by the way, but I also knew what Roselle was doing. And I also knew Roselle. I knew dogs and no dogs. And what all of that told me was whatever was going on wasn't such an imminent threat to us that we had to run out on a blind panic, which wouldn't really work anyway. But more important, that we could evacuate, at least for the moment, in an orderly way. Okay, yeah, at any second, the building could have just collapsed around us. And if that were the case, wouldn't have mattered, right? Right. But, But the point is, what... I understood was that Roselle was telling me, however she could in her own way, hey, I'm good, and wasn't exhibiting fear at all. She had to sense other people were afraid, or people were, but she wasn't afraid, and she wasn't exhibiting, experiencing anything that indicated fear, which told me we could evacuate in an orderly way. And that's when I told David, David, get our guests to the stairs. Don't let them take the elevators. Um, and uh, I finally got him to focus and, and he did. And, you know, we went from there, but we, we need to really understand more of what goes on around us. So should I expect David to be an expert on dogs? Not necessarily. Um, and, and so he may not have been able to understand all the things that I did, But all he was focused on was looking outside the window and seeing fire and smoke and millions of pieces of burning paper. And it took work to get him to refocus. And we have that happen all too often in everything that we do. And the the bottom line is, most of the time, if we train ourselves, we can see other things that are going on other than just the first thing that we see in front of us. Mm -hmm. And we really need to learn to look at all of that. It's again, it's a part of the mind muscle that we have to develop. If you really work it well and you really spend time learning about controlling fear and learning to look at all the things that are around you and letting fear help you do that, the decision like the one that I made doesn't need to take a long time. It took a heck of a lot longer time to tell you about it than it did to actually make it happen because it all happened in like about 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. But even right from the outset, when I kept telling David, don't worry about it, let's, 
We'll evacuate, but we'll do it in an orderly way. No, no, no. We got to get out of here right now. There are millions of pieces of burning paper falling outside the window. Slow down, David. Right from the outset, I did that. And I didn't have any doubt about what David was saying. But the point is, I had been working so much in my life to observe as many things as I could that I immediately understood, hey, Roselle's not being bothered by this. Mm -hmm. And that tells me a lot because dogs's sense dogs's dog senses are certainly more acute in a lot of ways than ours are. And if there was something that affected her, then she would have told me. That's right. So, so it's all about really learning to be more observant, to be focused and controlling that fear and not let it overwhelm you so that you can't make any decisions anymore. That's the biggest issue. You either let fear blind you and you are not able to make decisions or you learn how to deal with it so you can make better and more intelligent decisions. And that's a process that if you work at it can happen almost instantly. You know, I've had essentially a lifetime of learning to do that. So another example, um, I lived in Boston for a few years. And Boston at the time, maybe still, had a, uh, and Massachusetts in general, had a record of not really very good drivers. They didn't really pay <laughs> attention to everybody else. I think Boston drivers were better than New Jersey drivers because Boston drivers, even if you're in an intersection, they'll try to not hit you if, if you are out there when they're trying to go through, even though you might have the light. New Jersey drivers don't care, but that's another story. <laughs> I, I could tell you stories. But anyway, um, there were a number of times that I would tell my guide dogs to go forward to cross the street, and I didn't hear a car. And suddenly I heard a car coming. I was aware of it. And the car clearly um, was coming up to the corner and was going to, and, and either would stop because they would see that someone's in the intersection and that we had the right of way, or they wouldn't stop and they thought, oh, I can miss him and, and turn right and go on, right? Because right on red. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is that I didn't know what they were going to do. So what I learned to do was to listen for that kind of thing. And if something like that started to appear to be what I was going to be encountering, I'd start running a whole lot faster with Roselle to get across the street and get out of the way of the car. And I learned to listen and observe those kinds of things, which is again why I say what you need to do is to train your mind. And that was one of the things that I used to to help train my mind. A person with eyesight wouldn't necessarily see the car coming up from behind them either <clears throat> and wouldn't really know it until the car was turning right, but they could learn to listen and use that additional information to help draw a better conclusion. You're teaching me something here because I always thought that when someone was in a state of fear and panic, like your, um, like your buddy was, did you say his name was Frank? David Frank, yeah. David Frank. Um, David. Like he was so, I thought that part of your brain that was logical and rational kind of shut down. But what, what I but hear- it does. Saying, it does until you train it. But that's what I'm saying is I didn't know we could train ourselves out of that. <laughs> we, we underestimate what we can do and what our brains can do, which is really the issue, right? Um, why, why shouldn't we be able to, to train ourselves? We've got so many examples of it. I mean, look at SEAL Team 6 and what they did you know, with bin Laden, but just so many military things. Look at pilots. Look at Sully Sullenberger, who um, had birds, birds fly into his jet engines, but was able to keep his composure. And even though he landed his aircraft and the passengers got out in the Hudson, he kept his cool and did that. And there are so many examples because people do learn and train themselves to not just let themselves be overwhelmed by fear. Mm -hmm. And was Sully um, fearful? You bet. But <laughs> he could control it. And there are and those people who get like really um, even more focused under pressure. I know there's people like that. Well, but they've learned that, right? That's true. Um, so. In 1937, um, a guy named Herb Morrison went to, um, I think it was Lakehurst, New Jersey, because 
the Zeppelin, the Hindenburg, was coming in from Germany, and it was a, a passenger, I believe, a passenger uh, blimp or Zeppelin. And it was coming in, um, and so the, he went and other reporters went to cover it. The difference between Herb and everyone else is that <clears throat> it was a little late getting in, and none of the reporters decided to wait, so they left. He waited and was there when whatever occurred, whether it was a lightning strike or whatever, the whole Zeppelin just burst into flames and crashed. Mm -hmm. And he kept his cool enough to be able to give a complete report of what was going on as the Zeppelin crashed and, and afterward. He focused in doing that. And it's something that we all can do with whatever we, we have going on, <clears throat> but we do have to train ourselves to do it. Yes, yeah, some people probably do it easier than others, but that doesn't mean that we can't train ourselves to do it. And we have to train ourselves to do it. That's why I always say I'm my own best teacher. It's my job to teach me to do that. I have to learn how to do it, but I have to make the commitment to do it. But I hope it makes me a better person that I do it. Right. You know, I, when I, you had me on your podcast, Unstoppable, and I, know, I don't know if you remember me telling you this, but like I was kind of conditioned with generalized anxiety my family right. it's like a family thing and i had to train myself and learn how to redirect my thoughts that's what i always called it like redirect right. catch yourself and be like okay that's gonna go that's gonna be a downward spiral if you keep going down that <laughs> that sure. so i definitely get what you're saying i still feel like um when that happens it's it's usually it's usually not for any nothing like what happened with you. Like I've never been tested with something big like that yet. So I would hope that I've trained myself to the point where I could not have a complete meltdown. We'll put it that way. Well, and, and, and that's exactly the point. And, and what you, it's an ongoing process. And um, what you need to do is to always look to help control whatever is going through your mind so that you focus on dealing with ever unexpected situations come along. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of them. I mean, and I think that a lot of people who drive cars, it's the same concept. You train yourself. If you really work at it, you train yourself to deal with the unexpected situation that comes along. You train yourself to be able to uh, maybe slam on the brakes sooner or, turn um, the wheel to avoid something or whatever the case happens to be. All too often, we don't spend enough time doing that. And so we don't know how to do it. And we end up in more accidents. And again, sometimes an accident could very well occur that we had no control over occurring because it was just too close or whatever. But again, it's how we deal with it. And that's part of the issue. Yeah, we, we can learn to know how to deal with things in advance. So in November of 2022, my wife became ill and passed away after 40 years of marriage. And I could have dealt with that in a number of different ways. One, I could have just gone off the deep end and cried and been very sorrowful and um, not to know what to do with myself because after 40 years, she passes away. Mm -hmm. Or um, I could be very sad and and all the things that go with that, but also say, okay, she has passed, but I've got 40 years of memories with Karen and I will move forward from that, but I'll never forget her. And as I also love to tell people, <clears throat> the other part about it is I know she's monitoring me. If I misbehave, I'm going to hear about it. So, <laughs> so, so I don't chase girls and, 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 you know, I could say, unfortunately, nobody's chased me either, but that's another story. <laughs> So I'm not making a pitch to be chased, but, but uh, you know, I, I really do believe that um, our relationship was such that we learn from each other. And I'm sure she had fears as things were happening with her, but it was nothing that she was able to control. <clears throat> and um, it happened. And so we do have control over how we deal with whatever occurs. Were there tears? Yeah. You bet. But it, it, it can't be the end of the world. Right. And I've told my son this too, because, we, we, you know, when I, that's when I really think about things differently now that I, you know, well, my son's almost 21 now, but, 
But I tell him like, you know, when I inevitably die, I don't want you to focus on that death. I want you to focus on all the memories, just kind of exactly what you were saying. Focus on all the good things. Celebrate my life. Don't focus on my death. That would be the opposite of what anyone who who transitions would want their their person who's still alive to be doing is focusing on the the end days, the death, the suffering. You know, like, you know, when my mom died, I could sit there and think about all of the mm-hmm suffering that she went through with the cancer, but, or I could think about, you know, her life and one of them makes a lot more sense. (laughs) Well, and if we believe in God and we believe in things like the Bible, for example, what is death really anyway? Um, And as you just said, it's a transition. Mm -hmm. It, it isn't the end. Um, You can have the faith to believe that or not. It's okay. But either way um, you something will happen to to each of us right. and and the bottom line is that we can choose how to deal with it so many people are totally afraid of this thing called death or whatever the transition is rather than maybe working to learn a little bit more about it and there's a lot of stuff out there about death and dying and transitioning and um and so on and the bible has a lot in it and it's it's kind of funny um, because in the Bible, Jesus talks about how we all can do the same things that he does in greater things and that mm-hmm. we'll all be together and, and so on. Yet so many Christians are afraid of death. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm missing something here. <laughs> Why do we allow that to enter our minds if we're purporting to believe all this other stuff that's in the Bible? Right. Where's the faith? <laughs> yeah, where is the faith? And um, where is the the desire to understand more about it. Um, Tolstoy was really right. The biggest problem with Christianity is a lot of people don't practice it, but you know, <laughs> so I don't think it's just Christianity, but you know, nevertheless. Yeah. I always say um, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you a car. It's your actions. It's your daily actions. It's not about just the, the some people just, <clears throat> Think that's what they do. They go to church and that's it. And they don't practice any of the things yeah. <laughs> that are actually the, the teachings of Jesus. Or to make it easier, standing in your garage doesn't make you a mechanic either. But you know, <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. I hear you. So Michael, I, uh, you were born blind, correct? Right. So it sounds like all the things you were telling me, it all, and, and I've heard something like this before, but does that make all of your other senses? And it sounded like this, you're, you already kind of answered it, but like, it seems like all of your other senses are more de- like super senses. Like you're, no. is that, is that a thing? No, no, no. Um, only it's, it's again, I'm going to go back and refer to things like seal team six and all that. Mm-hmm. They only get better if you use them. Right. Mm. And look, I know any number of blind people who don't hear very well. I mean, they can, okay. but they don't learn. Um, I know some who, who are better at it than I. It's all a matter of learning to use your senses. They don't suddenly become better simply because you lose your eyesight or whatever. Um, it's, it's a matter of what you choose to do to learn and develop and, and as a result, heighten your senses. <clears throat> but it's not an automatic thing at all. That makes sense. And I know, um, and you were kind of, t- without saying the word, um, you're kind of talking too about with this developing our brains. I know we used to think, oh, well, that's just how your brain is and you can't change it. But now neuroscientists are all about talking about neuroplasticity, which means we can rewire our brains. Like yep. they're learning that we're not, yes, we've got the hard wiring, but we can actually um, add new software, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> like right. if we think of our brains like a computer. Right. Um and we can we can enhance the firmware mm-hmm. um, as well, but but the problem is we talk ourselves into thinking we can't do stuff, you know. And and um, um, as some people say, either, um, either you you know you can or you can't. Um, either way is right. Yep. Which you're going to do, mean. or when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Which way <laughs> do you want to go? It's up to you. That's so true. I love that so much. So are there from are there any other lessons that you want to 
I'm trying to respect your time. Are there any other lessons that you want to bring up before we say goodbye? And by the way, guys, I'm going to have all of Michael's contact information and he does, you are accepting speaking engagements now, correct? I am able to travel again, um, unfortunately, because we lost Karen, but she isn't here. So I can travel and she'll travel with me from wherever she is if she wants okay. to. But um, yes, I, I, I need an income. So I'm looking for speaking opportunities. Absolutely. And if people want to um, reach out and explore that, they can email me at speaker at michaelhingson.com. That's speaker at M-I-C-H. A-E-L-H-I-N-G-S-O-N.com, speaker at michaelhingson.com. Um, I want to briefly also talk about Accessibility. I mentioned that it's a company that makes products yeah. that make internet websites more inclusive and accessible. If people visit accessibility.com, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E.com, one of the things you can do there is click on a link that talks about getting a free website audit. You can type in your website name, and it will actually conduct an audit at no charge <clears throat> that you can then download. And it will tell you what is and is not accessible or compliant or um, adhering to the guidelines of the web content accessibility guideline system. In other words, it'll tell you what's accessible and what's not. Mm. Um, accessibility is really kind of neat because it uses some AI techniques and other software that's been built into the system unless you've got a website over a thousand pages, it's $490 a year to use. Once you decide, oh, I want to make my website more accessible and it's a scalable thing and it constantly monitors it. But I started Unstoppable Mindset for, for accessibility, as I said. If people want to learn about that, they can find Unstoppable Mindset where inclusion, diversity, and the unexpected meet anywhere podcasts are available or they can go to www.michaelhinkson.com slash podcast. And if they just go to michaelhinkson.com, they can learn about a lot of the speaking uh, topics that I have available and they can learn more about me and they'll see some videos there. And um, But I love to communicate with people. So people are always welcome to reach out to me at speaker at michaelhinkson.com. That would be a lot of fun. And hopefully I can come and, and inspire. I believe that as a speaker, um, Yes, I tell the World Trade Center story and I have other talks that I give, but I customize every talk I give. I work with the people who are planning events and <clears throat> want them to tell me, based on everything that we discuss, how I can make their event the best one possible. It's not about me. It's about my audiences. So I also, uh, and I'm absolutely serious about this, I don't talk to an audience. I talk with an audience. Mm. And I will say things to elicit reactions, not in a negative way, but um, I've, I've learned to listen to audiences when I say certain things. So I know how engaged I am with them. Um, and I always love to answer questions. And, um, and I always like to whenever possible leave time for that. But I talk with audiences and not to audiences and customize what I do based on working with the event planners to do it. It's a lot more fun. Yes. Um, it's, it's not about lecturing an audience, you know, and I, and I love not to use things like PowerPoint slides because I want people to be listening to me, not trying to read a slide. Uh, that's what a lot of people do. They just run these slides and they almost just read from the slide presentation. Well, where's the fun in that? I'm with you on that. Yeah, I'm not a PowerPoint girl. Um, well, that is, that's amazing. I love that you customize your speeches and that makes sense because you, and you have so much life experience, you know, that, that it really, you could, speak about whatever. <laughs> well, I had one speech I was hired to give in um, Myrtle Beach. Um, and I flew in, I was I got there the night before a speakers bureau had set it up and they told me all about the organization. And um, when I when I got there, it was too late to get a chance to meet with people, which I love to do. And my speech was first thing in the morning at their breakfast meeting. So we all got down to breakfast and it was a really nice breakfast. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard people talking and I went, this doesn't sound like what I was told that it was. So I talked to the, to the people um, who were at my table. and I said, tell me about your organization a little bit more. And I learned sure enough that what the speakers bureau person had told me was totally wrong about what this was all about. Literally 
in 10 minutes, I had to flip the entire speech at least to a degree because they wanted the September 11 story, but I had to come up with other things to talk about, which I was able to do to engage them, which also, by the way, led to other speeches. But if I hadn't done that and just gone with either having written something or just gone with what I was originally going to do, um, I would have been laughed out of the, out of the building. <laughs> Not many people could have handled that one. <laughs> so, you know, but, and I don't say that to, to brag, but, I believe that it's my job to understand, well, nowadays, I won't, when I work with any speaking um, or speakers bureaus or whatever, they can tell me what they want, but I always want to meet with the actual event planner and, and understand. Um, and it makes more sense. So that was a lesson I learned. And I liked this quote from, I got from your website, I, I was, you, you kind of just kind of nailed it, um, where you said too, I have the advantage of not needing to look at an audience to know how they feel about my talk. I'm kind of envious of that, you know, <laughs> because- but, but you could learn to do that. <sighs> I don't know if I could, block, like that, that's probably one of my, my, my bigger things is that I do read the audience a little too much. Like not, not here, like not while doing a podcast, but you know, either in person yeah. and not letting that affect you. I haven't mastered that. We'll just put it that way. Well, it's a, it's so it's a work in progress, but you yes. can learn to do it. I love to be in um, a presentation, and um, if it's not completely full, invariably people won't sit in the front row, mm -hmm. and I and I can tell that easily enough. So it's fun when I start an, um, a speech, and I know there aren't people in the front row. I said, "How come none of you are sitting in the front row?" What about you wusses? Somebody come up here and sit in the front row. You know, and I'm not trying to embarrass people, but it does impress people that I even know that. That's right. And, you know, the, the bottom line is that we really need to uh, interact with people. And I think it's very important not to treat an audience like they're somewhere you're not mm. um, and, and never can be because you're just talking to them. Right. I can be the expert, but I can still talk with an audience. And I don't even care what the age is. I've I've done this to um, elementary school audiences and talk about my dog and stuff. I went to one school up in San Francisco and the teacher said, now you can't talk with these kids very long. You won't hold their attention. You can only talk about five or 10 minutes and that's it. <laughs> we started and 35, 40 minutes later, I finally said, okay, um, this has been fun, but I want to answer any questions that you guys have. <clears throat> I knew what I was going to talk about. I was going to talk about my dog, show them what my dog does and talk about being blind. And it wasn't about the World Trade Center, although I could talk a little bit about some mean people did something. But right. anyway, here's the real kicker. <clears throat> I opened the floor to questions and this third grade boy got up. Of course, it was a boy. <laughs> he gets up and he said, I have a question. And I said, OK, what's your question? How do blind people have sex? No way. Yes way. <laughs> third grader? Third grader. Yikes. So, how would you answer that? <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> My response was the same way everybody else does. And if you want to know more, you go ask your parents. I'm not an idiot. <laughs> That's a good you know, answer. Um, quick. But, you know, the, the point is that um, I enjoy working with audiences and um, interacting with them. So, I'm hoping that we will get to to do a lot more of it. As I said, I uh, love to tell people I got to have an income. I have, don't have enough money to retire yet, like a lot of people. So I'm hoping that I'll have the opportunity and the blessing to be able to, um, to meet with people. If anyone wants a speaker, email me again at speaker at michaelhingson.com and we can talk and kind of go from there. And I am going to have, for anyone who did not have a pen handy during this podcast, <laughs> check the description box. Um, and you will find all of his links, all of all the ways to contact him there as well. Do and you I, have the link about the new book? I do. I have the link. Oh, good. Okay. The new book. Great. Um, you've got Thunder Dog. You've got Live Like a Guide Dog. And um, I'm going to have all of those links available and, and your website too. So everyone can contact you for, for yep. any reason. And, and I, would, I would also say if there's anyone who wants to be a guest on Unstoppable Mindset, Oh, Just email yeah. me at speaker at michaelhingson.com. Mary Beth did. We grilled her good, guys. Um, <laughs> but I'd, I'm always looking for more people who want to be a guest. So just email me at speaker at michaelhingson.com and we'll go from there. 
and uh, talk about it. And, you could do uh, what we did, be each other's guests. Yeah. Be yeah. each other's guests. Yeah. If you have a podcast of your own, always well ready to be on your podcast too. Yeah. Networking is a beautiful thing. Cheers. And I would like to thank you again, Michael, for being such a wonderful guest and inspiring and motivating, you know, taking away people's excuses. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, you know, because I hope so. Yes. That's a, that's a, it's a beautiful thing when we go from being that, having that victim mentality to being yeah. the hero of our own life, really. Well, um, love to help any way I can and inspire people. And I'm always ready, willing, and able to do it. And, you know, for anyone who, if this inspired you, please hit like, please comment. We would love to hear your thoughts. Please share with anyone who you think would love to hear the story or have Michael as a guest speaker. And I just subscribed to your YouTube channel. So, uh, oh, thank yeah. you. All yeah. right. Well, thank you so much. And um, again, don't forget to like and share. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.